Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Carl Crawford. I am the Human Rights Officer for the City of Duluth, and it is my honor and pleasure to be your moderator tonight. Um, I'd like the opportunity to introduce you to our own Mayor Emily Larson. Hi, everybody. My name is Emily. Welcome to Duluth. Those of you who are viewing from a virtual reality or vir virtual life, we are happy to have you with us. And those of you here in person, thank you so much. Um, we have been given permission to remove masks um, while we're speaking, so some of us may choose to do that or do that while we're on the panel here, so just wanted to um, share that. We are all really honored and delighted to be here, and I think mm -hmm. Carl is also serves as our human rights officer, yes. so I think you'll talk us through the introductions. Um, but I will say that one of the things that's really been paramount for me as a mayor is uh, really trying to create policies and changes that create opportunity for all people. And that's why I'm here for this discussion today, to learn more about what can we do to advance uh, students, young people, families, uh, what are the things that are holding us back systemically and intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, and so I'm here to learn more and to speak a little bit about what those realities are for our community and for the city of Duluth. And I think while some of what we experience here may be unique to this community, um, it is certainly, uh, so many things can apply more broadly, and so very eager to have this conversation. Thank you to Zeitgeist for hosting us here. Thank you to the Federal Reserve Bank uh, for the conversation. Justice Page, uh, terrific to meet with you today as well. So with that, Carl, we're Thank headed you. back to you, I think, yes? Thank you, Mayor Larson. Okay, it is yeah. my honor as well to introduce Justice Alan Page, a man who probably doesn't need much of an introduction but he is the co-founder of the Page Educational Foundation. Welcome, Justice Page. Thank you. We also have with us to my left is John Magus. He is our Duluth Public Schools Superintendent. Very lucky to have him here in our community. I believe this is year number two? Yep, so <laughs> about 14 months. All right, outstanding. Very happy to have you here. Also to my left is Kevin Lindsay. Kevin Lindsay is the former Human Rights Commissioner for the state and is currently the CEO of the Minnesota Humanities Center. Let's welcome Kevin. And to my far right is Neil Kashkari. Neil is the president of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank. So let's welcome everyone, all the panelists, to our conversation today. And I will start with our first question, and I'm going to open that up to the panelists to feel free to answer that. And that is, what's working well for students or youth in the current educational system, in the city, or the workplace, or the economy? What is working well? Please, Neil. I'm happy to start. You know, if you look, I moved to Minnesota five and a half years ago when I became president of the Minneapolis Fed. And I'd done some research on Minnesota before I got here. On average, Minnesota has good schools. On average, Minnesota has a highly educated workforce. On average, Minnesota's kids are doing well and getting well prepared for the global economy. So the, the averages are really good, and we should be proud of that. The problem, of course, is those averages mask terrible disparities beneath mm -hmm. the surface. Uh, and that's where a lot of us are spending a lot of time uh, to, try to, to try to really get at that at a fundamental level. But there's a lot of good that's being done in Minnesota for Minnesota's young people today but it doesn't include all of our kids, and it needs to include all of our kids. Outstanding, thank you. Other panelists would like to? Sure, I would say that uh, being new to Duluth and new to Minnesota, uh, but there are many, many uh, trends that are similar here as, as in uh, other places that I've worked. I would say uh, that you know w there's a lot of work being done to help our students accelerate their learning as we're coming back, hope hopefully to a new and better normal after the pandemic. Uh, and I think that, that really a big part of it is the caring, uh, open-heartedness, and, and just dedication that our teachers show and our administrators and other, other individuals who are there supporting. I do think, though, as well, that there are uh, internal challenges that need to be addressed, those disparities, those, those inequities that we see, uh, opportunity gaps that have been uh, historically in place for underserved populations for many generations. Those are things that really uh, need to be worked on. But I do think that there's the heart and the mind uh, on the part of our educators to take that on and do their absolute best to, to close those gaps. Excellent. If, if I may, too, Please. I think one of the things that I've noticed um, to kind of build on these comments is that it feels to me that Minnesota, we are a state that really does good talk. 
uh, we, we seem to really talk about wanting to advance all people. We seem to really talk about wanting to make sure that all kids are ready and prepared to thrive. And, and, and then we don't really back it up as much as we need to, as much as we can, as much as we're supposed to, as much as we're kind of called to as a mandate of just being in you know, shared humanity with one another. We chronically underfund. Um, education uh, communities often choose not to invest in additional levy capacity, you know, all sorts of different ways. And, and I have found that challenging even for myself. You know, as a parent, my kids have just finished the, the public uh, K-12 education system as of last spring. But it's hard. You really are working so hard to do the best you can with the kids in your own circle. And, and we have to challenge ourselves to think beyond our own circle and to really envision um, all kids in that circle. And so, you know, I think I struggle with that as a parent, as a mayor, but I think actually as a state, we do great talk. Um, but I, I, you know, across all political spectrums, but I have yet to see us really walk it to a, a place that I think a lot of kids and families would say, yes, that's exactly what the state is about. Absolutely. Thank you. Justice Page, if I can start with the next question. Sure. What is the single most pervasive barrier to support change in the current educational system? within the city, the workplace, or the economy? Well, let me just follow up on what the mayor just said. Uh, we do a good job of talking. Yes. But when all is said and done, more is said than done. And we need to start doing as opposed to just talking. And now I've forgotten your question. <laughs> Hold on. No, no. What is the single most pervasive barrier to support change in the current educational system within the city, the workplace, or the economy? The single most important or the single biggest barrier? Well, I would say it's an education system that fundamentally systematically and systemically leaves too many kids behind. It doesn't work for students of color, whether they be black or other students of color, indigenous students, doesn't work well for poor white students, mm -hmm. doesn't work well for disabled students. We need to get at the heart of why that is happening and why it doesn't work well for, you know, we're coming to the point where it's going to be the vast majority of students. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we can't, as a state or even a local community, we can't afford that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Kevin Lindsay, kind of the same question. What do you see as the single most pervasive barrier right now facing us? of the state. Carl, I appreciate the question. I think actually there's not one thing, and I think that's part of the problem. There's too many times within our society we think that there's one thing, one silver bullet. If we do that, mm -hmm. then all of our problems go away. And all of the things, uh, President Kashkari, the mayor, the superintendent, they all spoke to things that we need to be passionately committed to and moving forward every day. So this idea of funding and understanding it, ensuring that every kid gets what they need, this idea of being committed and seeing the whole child is critically important. I mean, as a commissioner of human rights, we had done a study about suspensions, and it was shocking that you know, the state of Minnesota, if you're an African-American student, you're eight times more likely to be suspended mm -hmm. than a white student. Mm -hmm. And if you're an indigenous child, you were 10 times more likely. And, and those were double the national averages, mm -hmm. which is surprising for a state that talks about uh, being really committed to being inclusive. So I, I applaud uh, the push by the Fed within this area, mm -hmm. but I think we've got to first understand that we're not going to solve this problem with only one solution. Mm -hmm. We've got to move and do a lot of things very well, and then we've got to sustain it. And it just can't be talk. It has mm -hmm. to be actual action. Mm -hmm. Thank you. President Kishkari, through your lens economically, what do you see? is the single most pervasive barrier. You know, uh, one of the things I think I've learned is that systems perform the way they're designed to perform. Mm -hmm. And we're getting the outcomes the system has been designed to deliver. And so I love what you said, Mayor, about our talk. I've been saying, I've been in Minnesota five and a half years, 
Minnesota is world class in talking about equity. I've never lived anywhere. I've lived in a lot of places. I've never lived anywhere where they talk about equity this much. And to be so removed from the reality on the ground is jarring to me. And so, you know, that's why, you, you know, um, Commissioner Lindsay, you talked about how do you sustain it. Mm -hmm. That's why Justice Page and I said, we want to sustain change. Go to the foundation of our state. And that's why we've said, let's focus on the constitution of our state. Because elected leaders come and go. Political parties switch powers. But the most enduring structure we have in our democracy are our founding documents, whether it's the US Constitution or the state constitution. And that's why Justice Page and I have a proposal to create a civil right for every single Minnesota child, every black, brown, white, rich, poor, disabled, able-bodied child to get a quality public education. And then it makes delivering on that right the state's number one priority. We think enshrining that value in the Constitution can provide, it won't solve everything, I agree with you 100%, but it can provide the sustained focus over years and decades that are needed to finally address these inequities. Thank you. Mayor Larson, if I yeah. can, you kind of started the conversation with you all think a lot about justice and inequities. So what is your hope for the educational system moving forward? Maybe the educational ecosystem in the next 50 years. How would it be different? And how could it possibly support I feel students? like that's a big question, Carl. <laughs> it's a big one. <laughs> could have prepped it's, me for that one. It's a mouthful. <laughs> we work together. Um, you know, my best hope, I think, you, you know, to be really candid, as a parent, what I want for my kids is for them to have a sense of agency, purpose, value, belonging, and 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 that includes a K-12 education and and a life beyond K-12. That is what I think is fundamentally um, at stake in, in, at the intersection that we're at for all kids. That we are losing dozens and. So many families, I know this, that we're losing them in this community, and it, it's um, it's heartbreaking because that is our responsibility uh, to be better, bolder, stronger, uh, smarter, more uh, fully kind of policy-wise integrated, funding more comprehensively strategies that help people get ahead. Um, and you know, as a mayor, doing the pieces that I can within the lane that I that I am in, and trying to also switch lanes accordingly when you can do that safely and, and maneuver back in uh, before your, your exit comes up on the highway. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, to me, it does feel like having just, and first of all, I just want to say thank you to people who are in the field of education. Having, uh, I come from a family of teachers. Every, every one of us knows a teacher and appreciates a teacher. And I have seen how incredibly wrenching and difficult the past year and a half has been for the education, the education system, for anybody in it, uh, a staff person, a student, an educator. So thank you, because it seems like a very difficult job. Um, and nobody, uh, you know, kids are the things that get us all feeling something, whether it's our kid or someone else in our community. So thank you for helping to, you know, educate the passion of our future. But to me, the mm -hmm. ecosystem looks like uh, like kids who leave a K-12 system feeling with that, that sense of purpose and agency, and whether yes. that moves into community college, whether that moves into military service or paid work or, or four-year university, actually, to me, is less important. And, uh, but it is about getting a young person from 5 to 18 with a sense of, I belong here. Yes. I have hope about my future. I have a space where I fit in, where I belong, and and that can look different for every kid, mm -hmm. and that can look appropriate and supported for every kid and family. Mm -hmm. And I don't know exactly how to get there. And it's, you know, what's interesting, and I have a couple of conversations with different mayor groups um, in Minnesota and around the country, and some mayors are very linear about, oh, I only talk about city. Like, if it doesn't, if it doesn't impact my staff or our budget, that's I don't go into that. And for me, it's a very holistic approach to governance mm -hmm. that we, I can't do my work without there being a strong county and a strong, strong school district. And so we have to reach beyond and push ourselves. And I don't know how to get there. Yes. I don't know how to get there, but I know that I'm here for this. Absolutely. And I'm here to start and continue to unpack what the problems are now so that we can get to some solutions. Mary Larson, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Superintendent Magnus, if I can ask you the same question as a, as a visionary, what do you sure. see 
Uh, what is your hope for the educational system here in Duluth? Uh, and again, I think it's it's very multifaceted, and um, I think that that in some ways, having transitioned right at the very beginning of the pandemic made it a little more challenging for me as a, as an incoming superintendent. I was actually interviewing here in March of 2020, and that's when when everything uh, shut down. Uh, and actually, I know quite a bit about education, believe it or not. It's not just about uh, virology. It's not just about uh, safe learning plans. Uh, there, there are many, many things that we need to do as a district and we can do as a district uh, related to in fully engaging the community in what our strategic plans are. How do, we, how do we engage our students, our parents, and the workforce within education to really uh, consider what are, what are the quality experiences that they would like us to see delivering? And really to make sure that there's, there's equity in that delivery of those systems. Everybody wants to be engaged. Everybody wants a safe environment. Everybody wants to feel that they belong and they want to make sure that they're achieving at high standards. And I believe that our educational system, that collectively we know what to do, but we have had challenges in funding. So, I th and it's not just a matter of funding, and we talked about that earlier today. It's not just a matter of funding, it also has to be a loosening of the way we do things. Mm -hmm. And I do have hope, uh, surprisingly, that because of the, partly because of the pandemic, it has shooken up the way that we do business. And I, my belief is that we can come back in new and better ways of serving our students and serving our families and working together with our staff to make sure that we can deliver on those equitable experiences. So the, the funding aspect is something that I'm very supportive of. I have uh, you know, given thought too though, uh, related to uh, standardized testing and some of the things that went on in the early 2000s with No Child Left Behind, that's when I became an administrator and I think that those there are aspects of accountability that are very, very powerful and very positive as far as being able to kind of use that carrot and stick to move forward. But I think it's also important for us to, to more fully de define what are the things that we need to see and what will, what will occur and how are we doing this from a supportive standpoint as we move forward, both supportive with finance, but also support, I believe in supportive accountability. So how do we make sure that it's a system that truly allows for full change. But I am ho very hopeful uh, and um, believe that we have it here in Duluth to move forward in new and better ways. Thank you so much. Other panelists would like to talk about what do you see as far as the future? Well, I really appreciate uh, both what was said by the mayor and, and the superintendent. So this idea of student engagement, and as the Minnesota Humanities Center, we work with a variety of different schools throughout the state of Minnesota, and we even sometimes work with schools outside of the state of Minnesota. Engagement is critically important. But what you found is that parents and students, if they're not engaged, it's so fundamental, you can't really have success as school leaders. So uh, sometimes we'll create story circles mm -hmm. to create opportunities for uh, every adult in the building to kind of hear what the real experience and what it feels like for the students and parents that uh, are connected to the school. We found that has been very engaging and helpful. Uh, the belongingness piece mm -hmm. and, and creating a vision for children to see themselves in that. So congratulations, kudos to the city of Duluth and taking you know, on some of its painful history, but also mm -hmm. talking mm -hmm. about the beauty and the forward thinking. Mm -hmm. That's critically important of both. Kids aren't, you know, they're not stupid. They, they know the past. They're hoping to have adults to guide and learn and create an environment for them to succeed? And are we willing to sort of invest in in that way? Mm -hmm. So I appreciate the efforts which are being done here to kind of create that ecosystem, to create that environment for it. But we got to sustain that. It just can't be one or two. It has to be throughout mm -hmm. the entirety of the school. And the last thing that I would say is the models that are working within schools how do we create more opportunities? And again, I, I will say, this is to this piece of the lane. Mm -hmm. So one of the lanes at the Humanities Center is we have an educator institute. We try to convene scholars and educators to talk about best practices that are going on, whether that's immersion, whether that's the new social studies standards, whatever that might be. But we need more, more people doing that, more people leaning in on those best practices. Thank you so much. Justice Page? Well, I was going to comment um, 
about standards. You know, we have these standardized tests that we give that arose out of No Child Left Behind. It would seem that they were, well, I don't know what they were designed for, but their effect is to leave a lot of children behind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, it's that silver bullet mm -hmm. that we think we'll have these tests and things will change. Well, that's not the way the world works. Having um, tests that, you know, measure or give us a snapshot of where a child is at a given time, in a given place, on a given day, that isn't used to help us decide how we help that child go forward to the point that um, I was, I, Justice Page Middle School in uh, Minneapolis, I was visiting there one day with a group of teachers, and I asked them um, how they used the MCAs to help kids advance. They looked at me like I was from Mars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they don't get the results until the children are long gone from their classrooms. Mm -hmm. What's the point of that? Mm -hmm. um, and so accountability is important. Mm -hmm. It's important for accounting how our students are doing. It is also important to account for how the system is doing with respect to our children. We don't do that at all. We don't focus, we, we focus to some degree, but not in the same way that we focus on these test results. Mm -hmm. And most kids that are uh, struggling, mm -hmm. most kids who are underperforming don't need another test to tell them that they're not, that they're being left behind. They know it. Mm -hmm. And somehow those of us who are adults have to start focusing on children and not on a, the parts of the system that make lives easier for us. Mm -hmm. And so that's why Neil and I are doing what we're doing. Because we think we can, if we shift the focus to put children first, mm -hmm. that will be the catalyst for real change. Excellent, thank you. President Kishkari, how do you see the future of, of education in this state? Well, you know, as this journey that uh, Justice Page and I have been on, uh, we've been meeting with lots of people, meeting with teachers and legislators and civic leaders, families, parents. And some people say, my gosh, this is long overdue. Yes, we need a civil right for children for quality at public education. And some people are saying, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm for kids first, but I don't know about that. And we always ask them, well, what's your plan? Mm -hmm. You don't like our plan? That's fine. What's your plan? So far, we have not heard anybody come forward with a plan that can actually lead to systematic change that can also generate bipartisan support. Minnesota is a politically divided state. One of the things that I'm really proud of, of the work that we're doing, is we've got strong bipartisan leaders on both sides of the aisle strongly supporting us. I mean, whether it's many Democrats of color in the legislature with conservative Republicans from greater Minnesota, the CEOs of the biggest businesses in Minnesota, and Attorney General Ellison. And these are folks who tell us, we don't normally agree with that, those guys over there. <laughs> but we all agree with this. Mm -hmm. And so that's exciting to me because a plan, a transformational plan that cannot generate bipartisan support is just a soundbite. So we're waiting. We're waiting for anybody who says, you don't like our amendment to create a civil right, that's fine. Show us your plan for transforming our education system for the future and show us that can generate bipartisan support. So far, crickets. So on one hand, I'm optimistic because I think that this amendment gives us a chance to really put children first. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, as I said earlier, systems operate the way they are designed. 
And the reason that Minnesota has not tackled these disparities in decades is because the system as it exists today works just fine for a lot of people. And you say, well, we want to change it so it works better for everybody. I don't know. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think we're at a gut check moment as a state. Do back to what the mayor said. Are we actually serious about changing things? I think the jury is out. Thank you so much. And that really leads to this next question, which I'm going to open it up for all panelists. And as Mayor Larson spoke about, even myself as being a father, when we talk about our kids, it's emotional. It gets us right here. It kind of mm -hmm. stops everything that's going on in the world. So what's inspiring you? What's motivating you about today's students or youth? What are you excited about? Well, I spend a lot of time in schools and classrooms. And quite frankly, the kids that I spend time with are my heroes. Mm -hmm. Their energy, their curiosity, their um, willingness to share and to express themselves, that's what gives me hope. Mm -hmm. That said, I see the other side of it, particularly with, you know, first, second, third, fourth graders. Mm -hmm. Boy, if we could, if we could bottle that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there is this, something happens along the way that for too many kids, by the time they're eight, nine, tenth graders, they've lost that spark. Why have they lost that spark? I'm not sure they lost it. I think maybe we've taken it away from them. Mm. And we have to do something to continue that spark or to recreate it for those who have lost it. Because it's there mm -hmm. in the beginning. Thank you. Other voices? Mm -hmm. So I had the opportunity today to be over at Lowell Elementary mm -hmm. with Justice Page. Uh, I want to oh, echo um, being in the classroom. Um, students were very excited. You don't have to worry about any marine biologist. I think I met about 12 <laughs> future ones today yeah. when I asked that yeah. question. Uh, what do you want to be? Uh, but we need to sustain that passion that, that students have. There are a lot of excitement among teachers. We need to take this moment in time, because it's a critical moment in time, this juncture that we have within our country. There's a lot of push and pull. Mm -hmm. To your point, Madam Mayor, do we broaden the circle to truly be inclusive for all and live up to the language within the ideals of the Declaration of Independence? Or is it going to be for a limited number of people? And I think schools can be that laboratory of democracy and push out in a way to fully realize that. So to me, I'm hopeful. I think we do have uh, an important moment before us. And if we lean in, we can accomplish great things. Um, because as President Kashkari has said, this is the moment in time. Uh, the evidence is clear. We need to move forward. And I, I would agree that, uh, again, the, the creative passion of our youth is just so inspiring, no matter what level it is. I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time with high school students, middle school students, but especially, the, as you said, the elementary students that, and I re remember reading a study once that said that uh, 90 to 95 percent of, of kindergartners think that they're good artists. Mm -hmm. But by the time they turn to, by the time they're seniors in high school, it's flipped, so it's 90% of the students don't think they're good at art and 10% do. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a parallel there with uh, students' belief in themselves as, as owners of their learning. And, and uh, I think a big part of it, is you, as you've mentioned, is really the power of relationships. I think that if we haven't learned anything during the pandemic, I think we've learned the importance of togetherness and relationships and experiences that really engage. And I think that, that because of that, there's an opportunity like none other for us to really re-engage the full community in a deeper way. I think it's also a telltale sign, however, that uh, throughout the country, and no different in Duluth or other places, or throughout Minnesota, 
the students who said that they actually felt like they did better during the pandemic are quite often our students of, of color and students from, from historically underserved populations. So I think part of the reason for that was because they didn't have that, that judgment as when they're coming into the classroom for the first time. They weren't under situations where maybe they were eight times more likely to be suspended. And so I think that, that in some ways, because of that, we have to really re-examine what was it about our system that made a, a vast portion of our students not wanting to engage and that we were not doing fulfilling our responsibility of engaging. So it's gonna take some um, deep creativity on our part and it's also gonna take some hard work. And when we talk about what will work, I think that really thinking about scientific improvement, when we're finding something that works, how do we make sure that we have the data and measures and not just standardized tests, but, but looking at discipline data, looking at engagement data, uh, looking at formative assessments, if we use that data so that we can replicate those successes, we, we need differences based in our, our different areas and different needs, but we also need to know if something is working in St. Paul uh, with, with a certain student group, maybe it will work with some of our students in Duluth too and vice versa. So how do we share those ideas and create that cross-pollination of ideas that we really need to change the system? Thank if you. I could, Carl. Please. Um, so one, of the, one part of your question was what, what gives you hope? Yes. Or, and I was thinking um, this June when I watched our younger son walk across the, the graduation stage and um, he, our sons went to Nettleton Elementary School and each time our two sons graduated, I noticed how many kids weren't there who, who really deserved to be there, who needed us to have their back to get them there. But in particular, this graduation, and, and certainly there were students who may have graduated and chosen for health reasons not to participate in a public safe ceremony. Um, but it is, um, it's heartbreaking to me that we are, as, you know, as systems, allowing for that to happen. There's a piece of research that I remember hearing when my kids were young that every child needs three people to believe in them who are not their parents, right? Or not their foster parents, or not may, legally required to care for them. This could be a neighbor, a, a teacher, a coach. And I have really thought about that research over the years. Who are we? Are those, who are we for those, those young people? Are we one of the three? Is there a way? And maybe that's a system even that can be there. Maybe it's a boys and girls club that can be that one of three people believing in that young person. Um, but it's really struck me lately uh, how much it's a collective effort for us uh, to do better, to do different. And, and, um, and you know, that's just our moral responsibility to one another. So I, I appreciate that there are these conversations that we get to have. I don't know um, uh, all the details on the amendment proposal, and I, I have questions about public funding and, and, you know, things like that and what that looks like. Um, but I also know that every kid deserved to walk across that stage. Mm -hmm. Really deserved it, needed it, needed that moment of accomplishment and, and agency, and uh, we missed it. We missed it. And that's not finger pointing. That's an us thing. That is really an honest yeah. us thing. And so that we can be better. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you, Mary. And that's one thing we always talk about as well is there's mm -hmm. no throwaway children. Yep. We have the responsibility to every child. And that's why I'm so excited that we're having this conversation. But one thing, President Kiskari, you, you brought up, and that is systems are producing what they were made to do. And I cannot, as an African-American man, not look at our educational system and not talk about racism, mm -hmm. systemic racism, and how do we rid that from our educational system. So what can we do? What can cities do? What can the Minnesota Human uh, Humanity Center do? What can we do in our society to change that? Well, um, forgive me, but I'm gonna keep talking about uh, the proposal that Justice Page and I are sponsoring. <laughs> you know, when we started, when I reached out to Justice Page more than two years ago because I didn't understand these disparities that are so entrenched and why we'd made no progress. And I reached out to him because I'm not a lawyer and he spent 22 years on the Supreme Court. And I knew that he had a lifetime of passion for education with the Page Education Foundation. So I asked him a question. Is there a way we could use the law to break through the barriers and to lead to real change. And we started by looking at the state constitution. All 50 states have a constitution. They're all different. 
all 50 state constitutions say something about education. Minnesota's education provision in our constitution today was written in 1857. And just as a quick history lesson, in 1857, slavery was still legal in much of America. Mm -hmm. So why is Minnesota's education system today producing the outcomes it is producing? Maybe is because it was designed in 1857, and it was not designed for poor children and black children mm -hmm. and brown children and indigenous children. Maybe the education, you know, and there are these wonderful teachers in Minnesota. We've met so many of them that are working so hard. But if the system is fundamentally designed against them and against the children they are trying to teach, they're just, I mean, it's, it's got to be an incredibly frustrating experience for them. Now imagine a world where the system is designed in their favor, supporting them, helping them, helping those kids. It's just a different world. And so when, I, when you ask me why is there racism in the education system, I would say to you, how can there not be when it's a system that was designed in 1857? Absolutely. I mean, it's that fundamental. Yes, thank you. Others? And I'm kind of getting assigned to that. I need to start asking some questions <laughs> from the audience as well. But others would like to talk about that. So one of the things which is going on currently within our country is this conversation about critical race theory. Hmm. And the way that President Kashkari talked about the way in which courts or the way in which the legal system might look at and interpret the law and understand would be defined by the circumstances of the time of the day of the respective judges. That's a conversation that might happen within first or second year of law school. So when we talk about critical race theory, that's very different than when we talk about race or the history of our country within K-12 education. So the first thing is let's have a real conversation about race in our country. If you look at textbooks, by and large, there's very little information about African American history within textbooks. Julian Castro was at an event, and he asked a prominent publisher of K-12 textbooks, name three uh, Latinx leaders that are prominently discussed within textbooks. Here's a publisher of a textbook. Person couldn't do it. So we're not having uh, folks overtake the country through critical race theory in our K-12 education system. What we're doing is we're having a long overdue conversation just about the history of race mm -hmm. within our country. And if we truly are, again, going to live up to the ideals of including everybody within, that's something what we should have as a democracy. Now, there are some people who have not been a part of that. Mm -hmm. They might feel intimidated or threatened by that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we should stop having the conversation. Mm -hmm. So let's honestly face what we are as a country. We are a country which has denied rights and enslaved individuals. It took us 400 years to get to this moment. Hopefully, it won't take us 400 years. But we've got to acknowledge that past history. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. We're not defined by the past history. We can chart a different history for ourselves. Let's do that. Let's lean in and create that different history by honestly talking about it, by honestly carving out a different future. That's going to be challenging. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that we can't do it. We just sent four individuals around the globe who weren't astronauts, and we landed them back on this planet. Are you saying we can't have a conversation about race if we can do that? And thank, thank you for pointing out the difference between wanting to really responsibly look at the results of our system through, through the policies, through the procedures, through our own actions that have created the results that we have. The difference between that and, you know, uh, to, to some degree, the, the polarizing aspects of critical race theory. I do think it's incredibly important that we examine the whole system, all the structures, the policies, the procedures, and I think that really uh, one thing that I do find fa interesting is when we th when we start thinking about what kind of policies, procedures, and laws can have an effect on on the system as a whole. I also uh, f fiercely own the responsibility that we have as schools and as educators for the things that are, are within our sphere of influence to control. And quite often, 
you'll find educators stepping beyond that sphere of influence to want to, to solve medical issues or mental health issues or food scarcity issues. And I think as, as Mayor Larson pointed out, it's vital that it's a whole community stepping up because if there isn't, if a child doesn't have a home to go to and they don't have food on the table and there are mental health issues that are unsupported, uh, it, it will be challenging for the school system alone to take on that full responsibility, no matter how much funding is there. But if we're really truly committed to this, I believe that we can change those systems and structures to have the different outcomes for our students that, that they all deserve. Thank you. Now we're going to open the opportunity for our audience. We have folks who have come to the theater to be a part of this. Thank you. And we also have um, uh, folks online. So we'd like to open it up for some questions from the audience. And all you'd have to do is raise your hand up and we'll come to you. Right over here. Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm an education case manager for Lifehouse. We serve youth. Um, I've also, I'm also a licensed educator and I've had experiences. Um, I have a non-dominant identity. I'm a queer person. And in interviews um, with admin, I mean, this was in a different state, um, but I had the question posed to me because I put community work in my resume. Um, I see you have the Homeless Persons Bill of Rights here. I see you have the Gay Straight Alliance. I see you have showing up for racial justice. I'm not sure how these things really connect to the classroom. Can you explain this to me? Um, so how can we support teachers of non-dominant identities so that they're understood, supported, and included in community school work so our students can see people like them who understand their stories and um, they can see successful people and successful adults that look and, and move in the same ways that they do. Thank you for that question. Panelists? Well, I will just say thank you for sharing your story um, and for asking a, a great question. Um, I think you need to have a system that wants to hear you. And so I think that, you know, that's, that's probably, you know, not to put you on the spot, Superintendent, but that's probably your lane to kind of um, mm -hmm. think about a little bit. But in my experience, and this is one of the things that I've been thinking about, what I think we need to do, if we want to be serious about education, we want to be serious about you know, supporting kids before we lose them and bringing them back. We got to ask them what they need. What does it look like to have an edu educational system that shows up for you? What does it look like for you as this family who's struggling to feel like this school district in this city has your back? Um, you know, in my experience as mayor, when we ask those questions of people who are impacted and we go to places where they are comfortable to ask those questions and to hear their answers, they will tell you the truth and it will sting and it will hurt and it will make everything hard and better if you're sincere about how you take the information in. So, you know, uh, as, as a former social worker and community organizer, my thought is you coalesce a group of people who have a shared experience and find the right institution to be able to say, we want to hear what that looks like, sounds like, feels like for you, and then how do we change a system to make that happen? But I'm now, you can take it from there, sure, Superintendent. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think, and I, I uh, appreciate the question as well. And um, some of the work that I've done previously is around uh, recruiting and retaining of, of um, educators from diverse perspectives. And I think that there are a multitude of ways that we can do that. One, some are through grow your own programming so that you have uh, uh, tuition opportunities that, that help uh, students of color who are interested in education become educators. Uh, I also, another positive thing is uh, creating affinity groups. So opportunity for, uh, you know, various individuals who are, are um, coming from a particular perspective to have opportunities to gather and talk about what are their experiences. But I think as Mayor Larson pointed out and um, others have pointed out as well, it takes first really truly listening. If I really truly listen to the experiences you've had as far as trying to get the jobs and trying to do that, then that influences me in a couple weeks when I'm hiring a uh, new director of human resources to make sure that we have somebody who isn't putting barriers in place for diversity because it's really uh, imperative. If we're really gonna engage people, we have to have diverse perspective at the table. 
we're, you know, a, a, a bunch of middle-aged white men are not going to necessarily see the plurality of perspective that's going to be needed to make some changes and do some things differently. So it's really uh, on us to make sure that we're not just recruiting diverse perspective, but we're doing everything possible to make sure that people are welcomed and retained as well. Thank you. We have another question from the audience. Hello. Sure. Um, thank you. Sorry. Um, so I am a product of Duluth Public Schools, middle and high school. Um, I did elementary in Minneapolis. Um, and I have an eighth grader middle schooler. He's 13, but he goes to private school. And I used to work for Duluth Public Schools. Um, so my experience there, this kind of piggybacks off of what you're saying, and it wasn't you, you were coming in as I was getting out. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but my experience there was not a pleasant one just as a staff member. Um, and I am looking around the room, I kind of stood up earlier just to kind of gauge the audience. And there's only two of us that look like us here. And I, I begged for us to be part of this conversation. I begged for, because I happened to be at a lunch with President Kashkari earlier today and heard about this one and asked if I could come and my friend here is an educator as well. And so I, I begged for us to be a part of that. So what are you doing to engage um, our community? What are you doing to engage parents to come out and to be parts a part of this conversation. Like, it's amazing to me to see so many brown people on the stage right now. There's so many brown people in power and a woman in power, and that's awesome. But I, like, what are you doing besides mm -hmm. that? Like, we need more than just faces on a stage, and we need more mm -hmm. than words of promise. Um, and I just, I don't see how we're being engaged when we weren't even. I guess, invite or know about opportunities like this to speak to people and to have real change happen. I kind of said a lot at once. But. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I think since the question is more directed towards me, if I don't mind Please. answering, and I'm, I'm very glad to. And as you mentioned, um, and I, you can't make excuses, right? I think that's part of it is you have to, you have to really truly assess, mm -hmm. the, have the courage to assess what is the challenge. And I, I think that uh, but I just I did just come come during the the COVID crisis, and so it was, there were some additional challenges there. My intention uh, was to start with fully engaging the community around a strategic planning process, and that is really a, an important part of what what we'll be doing this year. Uh, and I would give a couple of examples of things that we've tried to do as well. And maybe not every, I, uh, one, one would be the community conversation around school resource officers that we've had. We explicitly worked to find an outside ed entity, Marnita's Table, that, that was highly skilled and, and respected for, for bringing in diverse perspective to the conversation so that we can truly listen and can truly take into account those, those opportunities for change. So I'd say the strategic planning process is one. The uh, opportunities we've had trying to engage the community in a, in a fuller way, and we also have, have uh, increased the number of, of positions we've had that are in support of equity. And then I would say the third thing that we're doing is a key part of our operational plan and strategic plan moving forward is a full equity audit of the district looking at what aspects of equity do we need to take on first? Because you know, equity can affect, you know, it's, it's, it's part of everything, right? So when we're thinking about what bite of the elephant to take first, we wanna make sure that we have a deep analysis that, that will be through engagement of our students, staff, and parents uh, related to what their experiences have been so that we can learn from those and listen, as we said before, so that we can get better, so that we can make those changes. But it can't just be all talk and no action. Could I add? Please. Just, um, on behalf of the Federal Reserve, we have a very conscientious strategy, just like the lunch that we did earlier today, to reach out to diverse communities and women-owned businesses and small businesses, people that we have not done a good job engaging with historically. And it's, it's, a, it's a focused, serious effort. But I'll tell you this, it's hard work. And we're, we're proud to do that work, but sometimes we need help. So I'll give you an example. How do we reach people? We reach people through our website. We reach people through email lists. We reach people through social media. But you have to be on our email list. 
-hmm. You have to be connected to us on social media. And so one thing you could, first of all, you helped us by participating today. You helped us again by saying you want to come this evening. I'm thrilled that you did. And if I may be so bold, you can continue to help us by when we send stuff to you, which I hope you will be connected now, you can share it with your friends. Because part of this, uh, these networks grow organically, and we've been trying to grow them quickly. We're making progress, but we're not making progress as quickly as we would like. Uh, and so anything you could do to help us, we would welcome it. So thank you. Yes, the microphone. So I graduated from Denfeld High School in 2000. And back then, my mother was the only black teacher in all of Duluth Public Schools. Um, right now, there is only one black teacher in Duluth Public Schools, and she's student taught under my mother. And mm -hmm. it's been 21 years. It's been 21 years, and we have one black teacher. Like, I just, that hurts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it hurts our community, mm -hmm. it hurts mm -hmm. our kids, and I, I, we've had teachers come and go, so it's not that we're not getting black teachers, but what, what are you doing or what do you plan to do to keep educators here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need more, and then we need them to stay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as I, as I mentioned before, uh, previous to, to um, being here in Duluth, I was in Green Bay. And I worked really closely with the uh, National Education Association on a recruiting and retaining program. It was also uh, partially uh, focused, it was on recruiting and retaining of quality educators in general, but as part of it, we also recognized that quality means diversity. And so partnering with, with them, looking at what are some of the best practices of recruiting and retaining. Uh, some of the best practices, as I mentioned before, uh, formation of, of uh, supports for the educators we have so that the you know it's hard to have an affinity group with one person right but we need to make sure that we're we're gathering enough people and we have enough people in the workforce so that we are able to um, have those diverse perspectives but I think another really important part is what are we doing for opportunities for for grow your own programs because we have we if we look at the staff members we have we have more staff members who are coming from diverse backgrounds than we have educators or administrators. So what are we doing to uh, perhaps provide tuition reimbursement or uh, support programs for people who are interested in becoming educators? Because a lot of times institutions will recruit from far away to get diverse perspective uh, as employees in the district. But if people don't have the ties and they, there, there isn't that sense of community, people don't necessarily want to stay. So how are we taking the, uh, the employees of color that we have in the organization now and making sure that we're listening to those experiences and improving on those experiences so that we're not losing the very people that we have? That is something that is really important to us. And I did, um, I also, when I was hiring for my number two position, my assistant superintendent, I purposely was looking for a diverse perspective in that in that uh, in that hiring process because I think it's important for us if if we're going to have conversations about what we need to ch do to change our practices again it can't just be the same old old uh, people at the table we need to make sure that we're having people that are going to courageously challenge the realities that we have and then we have to have the courage to follow through on those changes too and that also takes it takes community courage as well because if the school district starts doing things in new and different ways, we have to make sure that, that the, the, the public and the community are understanding the what and the why so that we can, we can all move forward together. And to be honest, when we were talking a little bit before about the um, anti-critical race theory aspects, that concerns me that, 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 that sometimes those sentiments are, are growing in communities because I think sometimes what it makes people do is turtle in when it comes to things related to equity. And we need to have the courage to to stand out and do what's right no matter what. Thank you. I want to thank you all for your, your questions and really rich, rich dialogue. Do we have time for one more question? I think we have one more in front. Well, while the question's coming forward, I, I just wanted to thank the superintendent for his response about growing within. He talked about recruiting and retention. Too many employers think about recruiting mm -hmm. and not retention, and re retention is really where the action is. So I applaud you for that. 
Hello, everybody. My name is Veronica Kilian. I want to share a little bit about my story before I... It's more of a comment. It's not a mm -hmm. question, and it's, it's an offering. I went to school with Stephanie. So 21 years ago, we were both at UWS. And uh, fast forward, worked in Duluth, and was never, let's say what I brought in was never valued. Mm. And I went through, you know, I work in early childhood, elementary, middle school, anyway, I went through the, all, all the way uh, from pre-K to um, university. I was never retained, be it in Duluth Public Schools or any of the other areas, um, because what I brought to the table was not valued. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I moved to the cities thinking that over there things were, the grass was greener. Mm -hmm. It is not greener anywhere, mm. because um, non-white people are still treated the same way. So what I want to offer to you both, uh, Madam Mayor and uh, Superintendent, I am back here. I went to school here and I want to come back because when I left, Elder Cloudy Washington told me, when you go, get that education and come back to bring change. Mm -hmm. So I'm here, I have my doctorate, I teach at UMD, and I want to take you up on Grow Your Own program. I want to take you up on finding solutions Great. to bring change to the city. My name again is Veronica Kilian. You can Google me, whatever. But please, I will find you if you don't find me, because I have community engagement in my pocket, and I know where to find people. So this is what I'm offering, so that we can work on bringing change to the table. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's amazing. We yeah, we're, that's amazing, Veronica. And I'll give you my business card to get to them, too. We have one more question from the audience. Oh. Yeah, so <laughs> my name is Jordan Johnson, um, Executive Director of LifeHouse. Thank you all for being here. And just a quick question. Um, one, you talk a lot about parental involvement. We are mm -hmm. their parents yeah. at LifeHouse. Yeah. Um, and so just thinking around what that looks like around mm -hmm. community engagement and involving community partners who are potentially their parents. And then the other thought, I, th I, I was thinking around your law that you have going forward. And is there a possibility of potentially having a council for racial justice? Mm -hmm. like we talk about uh, new mm -hmm. human rights, but just calling it what it is, like having some kind of advisory group holding systems accountable mm -hmm. in some kind of government entity um, as a possibility, whether it's a local level or state level um, for consideration, or is that being considered at all? So, Thank you. To, would you're you, looking would at you like me, me to address? You're looking at me. Um, are, I can answer that please. in your closing comments, or how did you want to yes, do the next please. part? Yes, I would like you to answer that, and then we're going to close. And I want to thank our panelists, but we'd like uh, Mayor Larson. Because I know we're on a time schedule. We are on a time schedule. Um, Jordan, thank you for that. So I am completely open to hearing more about what that is. Yes, right now we have a Human Rights Commission. We also have an African Heritage Commission, an Indigenous Commission, and uh, a GLBTQ Commission, which I did not fully acknowledge the name of. I'm sorry, I just didn't have it in the corner of my brain. So that's what we're doing locally, and, and we have space to do more, always. Um, it feels a little inappropriate for me to be the close. There are really important voices here, each equally important, including yours in the audience. And I will just say uh, two things. One is when people uh, come into my office uh, and want to share something with me as mayor, I always, they'll often have facts and figures and a packet of information, which is awesome. But I'm not interested in that. We can come back to the facts and figures. Tell me your story. And so it was really awesome that we had four people in this room and probably more um, at a distance who had stories that needed to be heard and told. Because I can't argue with your story. I can't tell you whether your story is true or not. It's true, because it's yours. Mm -hmm. And when you start with your story, that is how you change and how you create change. And so thank you for sharing your story today and um, letting us know that that's, that's, I hear the call. So I'll just say that. And then uh, an earlier question uh, was about hope. What gives you hope? And I don't think I really answered it. But I think uh, one of the things that we are all here for is, of course, we're participants like you in this active democracy. And an active democracy that is changing shape and changing course and has cannot imagine a, a more dynamic time than the one that we've lived through. And what gives me great hope is that this generation of young people from preschoolers to 25, this is a no BS generation. They get it, <laughs> they see through it, 
they call it, um, and they are incredibly resilient. The fact that they are standing makes them resilient. The fact that they have withstood uh, whether they're living regardless and inclusive of where they are living and how they are living, they are living. And there have been tremendous pressures and chaos and political upheaval and all sorts of things that have caused uh, people to really find reasons to doubt the sincerity of people in power and the, the depth of our humanity, and yet they're there. And that gives me great hope and uh, and I think is part of the reason why all of us are here. We don't maybe have all the right answers but we have some thoughts about what some answers could be and some invitation for us to grow more, hopefully closer together by finding some shared answers that really move the entire state forward. So it's been really a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, such a pleasure to meet you, Justice. It's my first opportunity to visit with you. And uh, thank you all for, for investing in the conversation. And thank you, Carl, for moderating. Thank you very much. That wraps up our time together this afternoon. Let's give a welcome. Uh, uh, Thanks for our panelists today. I give them a round of applause.